First of all, let me apologize uh, if I'm going to speak English, because if it is true that I've studied French in school, it is also true that the school was public, so you <laughs> know. <laughs> As you've heard, I'm supposed to talk about the Italian model. Now, I know there are Italian models in fashion, in cars, but what about politics? I don't think we have any model to export. Uh, supposedly, I should talk for 20 minutes. Now, that's a very long time, especially in terms of, of money. Uh, uh, the Italian government spends $1.2 million every minute, so you understand how <laughs> worried I am about it. Um, instead of a model, I shall try to tell you a story. The story of what has happened in my country in the past two years. A veritable earthquake that has completely changed the rules of the game in politics. As a background, let's go back to the beginning of 92, when there was the widespread perception that the Italian system of government was hopelessly in crisis. In the 1980s, we had a terrible acceleration of government, of the size of government. From 19, in 1980, total public sector revenue amounted to 34.6% of GDP. At the end of 93, it was 48.8%. So revenue has grown faster than inflation faster than income, it has absorbed an additional 14.2 percentage points of GDP in 13 years. Uh, despite or because this acceleration in taxation, public spending, which in 1980 amounted to 43.5 percent of GDP, in 93 amounted to 58.6 percent. Public sector debt increased so fast that 90 percent of all the debt of Italy today was made uh, during the 80s from 1980 on. To give you an idea of the size of the debt, at today's exchange rates the Italian public sector debt amounts to two and a half times the total foreign debt of all of Latin America. Our yearly deficit alone is larger than the yearly deficit of the other 11 European countries of the Union. Italy is an economic giant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. As for the efforts uh, to uh, reduce the size of the debt. The past, the, the two governments before the present one are widely praised in the national and the international press as having done a great deal to contain uh, the financial disaster. Well, figures tell a different story. From the end of 1989 to the end of 1993, public debt increased by 700 trillion lire. Now, in real money, that's $500 billion, which is money. 40% of all our debt was made in the past four years. So this was one problem. Together with this problem, and the two are intimately related, corruption exploded. A big wave of scandals came out. Uh, we had several cases involving politicians, ministers, members of parliament, and so forth. And many people came to the conclusion that all our problems originated from our electoral system of proportional representation. The idea was that proportional representation increases the number of political parties. When you have too many parties, 
you have coalition governments, that is governments made by more than one party. And therefore it's not the people who choose the government, it's party leaders who choose the government after the voters have made their choice. So everybody started talking about that the root of all evil was partitocrazia, or party rule, and that in order to solve the problem, all that was necessary to do was to change the electoral system and things would be going very well, move from proportional representation to a new minimal system. I don't agree with this analysis at all. I think electoral systems are criticized all over the world. Uh, the German system is criticized, the French system is criticized, the English system is criticized, the American system is criticized. The fact is that people blame the midwife for the baby. They criticize the electoral system, whereas the problem is what politicians can do after they are elected. The problem is not how we elect them. The problem is what they are allowed to do once they are elected. I don't deny that electoral systems are important, but they're only part of the story. Take corruption. I humbly submit to you what I shall call Martino's law, corruption. Corruption is always and everywhere a political phenomenon. In order to have corruption, you need government intervention. Without government intervention, you don't have corruption. Let me illustrate. If I spend $10 and make $100, that's a good deal. If I spend $100 and make $10, that's a bad deal. If in order to make $10, I make someone else spend $100, that's politics. <laughs> anyway, what we did is we changed the electoral system and we adopted a 75% uninominal, that is single candidate, majoritarian system. 75% of all senators and deputies are elected uh, on a first-past-the-post basis and 25% are elected in terms of proportional representation. Now what happened is that at the end of 93 we had local elections with the new system and the left had organized itself into an aggregation of party, rassemblement, you would call it in French. And with 34% of the votes, they got 82% of the cities. Since there was no alternative organized on the other side, the left was organized, but there was nothing else on the other side. With 34% of the popular vote, they won the government of 82% of the cities. All the major cities have a left-wing mayor. At that point we realized that if we didn't do anything, Italy would have a left-wing government. And by left-wing government, I mean a government dominated by the reformed communists, PDS, the Democratic Party of the Left, by the unreconstructed communists, called Rifondazione Comunista, and by assorted lunatics. So we decided that something had to be done. And uh, I had met this successful entrepreneur. You probably have heard of him. His name is Silvio Berlusconi. And he had decided to do something to offer Italian voters an alternative to the left when election time came. The interesting thing about Mr. Berlusconi is that he never laughed when I expressed my libertarian views. You know, for years, we uh, radical free marketeers in Italy have been very few. In fact, at the time of the Mont Pelerin Society Conference in Stockholm, not many years ago, Sergio Ricossa, Veniero del Punta and I were on the same flight. And Rigosa said, we should never do that, because if the, flight fall, if the plane falls, all libertarians will disappear. <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, Domenico da Empoli was on the same flight, yes, that's right. <laughs> it would have been a disaster. The liberal tradition in Italy would have disappeared. 
And expressing liberal views in Italy for many years was a very uh, tiring and difficult uh, task because people would not listen. Instead, Berlusconi did listen. And so together, we put, to we put up a program, in fact, I wrote most of it, of radical reform. Uh, the program included a single rate income tax. It included school choice and education vouchers. It included the privatization of public health and health vouchers in its place. It included a reverse revenue sharing in uh, uh, the relationship between central and local government, Pri extensive pri privatization, you name it. A program was probably the most radical program ever presented, not only in Italy, but in Europe. In fact, Mrs. Thatcher would look like a moderate socialist compared to a program. Uh, these were the views that were debated during the campaign. Mr. Berlusconi uh, organized this movement called Forza Italia. You probably heard about it. And the debate for the elections began. And I remember those terrible weeks during which, at the beginning especially, Berlusconi didn't want to go on television because even though he's a TV tycoon, he told me, he said, I don't know anything about television. You go and debate. And so I had to go debate things on TV. And it was rather, uh, you know, nerve-wracking. Uh, but for me, why did I do it? I mean, I was in the university. I was a happy academician, tranquil life. The year had nine months. Uh, there were three hours in the week and 45 minutes to the hour. So why did I go into the rat race of politics? Because for the first time, I saw a chance of seeing my views debated in public. And that was what I always wanted. Let me stress one point. I had, and I have, no delusion about that radical program being implemented soon. The resistance of interest, the opposition of pressure groups, will make it impossible to have the radical reforms that we were talking about. We'll try, but I doubt that we'll succeed. However, it was very important to have the ideas debated, because this is the beginning of a process that might eventually lead to the kind of change we want. It's the beginning. If those views were not debated, we wouldn't have had any chance. So that was why I entered politics. I'll cut a long story short. The campaign was very hard. I did not want to run for parliament. In fact, 24 hours before the deadline, it said, no, I don't want to run for parliament. But Petrusconi was very insistent, and so I had to run. In fact, not only in one constituency, but in two. And since I live in Rome, he thought it wise to make me run in Sicily, 500 miles south, and in Milan, 500 miles north. During that terrible month, I lost seven kilos. <laughs> I had to give I don't know how many public speeches. I remember one in Catania to 1,500 people in Sicily, at the end of which I was forced to hug nearly the whole population, including a big dog. And uh, finally, the campaign came to an end. And the day the campaign was over, Carol and I were going back to Rome in the car, when Berlusconi called me, and he said, how do you feel? And I said, terrible. And he said, why? And I said, because if things go the way you hope, I'm going to be elected. <laughs> and if I am elected, my wife will have to sleep with a politician. <laughs> anyway, as it turns out, we won the elections. We won the elections on a clear mandate. And the mandate was that of changing things. I didn't want to enter the government. In fact, I told Berlusconi, he said, leave me out of it. And he said, uh, no, you must become a member of the government. And I said, OK, if you insist, I want to be a foreign minister. And he said, why? You've always been an economist. You campaigned for our economic policy. 
No, I said, I said, I want to be foreign minister because the foreign ministry is close to my home and it has a nice parking lot. <laughs> and that's how I became a foreign minister. Now, what does all this amount to? I mean, what can we learn from this very Italian picture? One thing, there is a great demand in all our countries for new ideas. Any politician who takes the risk of expressing radical pro-free market views is going to succeed. We must have the courage to support these views even though we know that in the short run we cannot implement them. We must start using elections as a pedagogic device to teach people the importance of freedom. They are prepared for it. They want to hear it. So, uh, if I could give a bit of free advice, I never give free advice, if the price is too low, uh, to my French friends, I would recommend that they start moving towards the radical libertarian position. And then maybe we will all... <laughs> we will all succeed. One final note of optimism. If Italy succeeds in solving her present problems, I shall consider that as definitive evidence that God is Italian. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, after five years, after five years of particip participating in such a radical systemic transformation, such a radical, profound, deep systemic change, you discover some rules, some generalities. Uh, simply, you discover that the transition has some logic which you have to know, and the more you understand it, the better. So let's uh, maybe talk about some generalities, uh, not, not about modeling our, our case. It seems to me that the Czech Republic has now entered what I, what I call the post-transformation stage already. It seem, I would uh, divide, I would structure the whole process in three stages. The first stage is the pre-transformation stage, then is the, the transformation stage proper, and then the post-transformation stage. When I speak to non-economists and non-experts, I, I try to, to make an analogy which, in my opinion, explains the, the point, well, the first stage is the waiting room in a hospital. And I must say that in the waiting room in a hospital, you must undergo various preparatory tests and to do some preparatory things. I must say that there are still post-communist countries waiting, which have been waiting in the waiting room, they are still dreaming about the possibility to take the pill instead of going to the surgery room. So as, a, as an economist, I would be able to name those countries. As a prime minister, I must say that there are some. And you may guess what countries belong to that group. So that's the first stage. In our country, it was the year 1990. The second stage is the surgery, is the surgery. That's the crucial moment of, of the profound systemic change when the basic, basic steps, measures are taken. They are not easy, they are sometimes painful to the citizens of the country. And the third stage is either the rehabilitation center of the hospital, or I prefer to talk about a fitness center. So I would strongly argue that the Czech Republic is already, as the first and probably the only post-communist country, in the fitness center already. We are simply improving our muscles to participate in the next Olympic Games in all disciplines available. <laughs> Well, it seems to me that the structuring is, is, has a deeper, deeper logic and, uh, and uh, I, I can debate, uh, not now, not here, the differences in those individual stages because in all those stages the role of the politics, the role of the government is different and is, has different tasks and uh, and it's important to know that it's for the young generation to, to write doctoral dissertations about exactly about that. So when I say that we entered, um, we entered the post-transformation stage already, uh, where, as I always say, the heroes of the game are not the radical reform politicians, but speaking in the in this, uh, in this atmosphere, uh, the heroes of the games are the Schumpeterian innovators, entrepreneurs, managers, simply not the political side of the matter, but the real people at the micro level. So the question is, what's the mechanism which has brought, at, brought us to that stage, to that level? And I will give, some of you will be there Monday, Monday morning at the Mont Pelerin Society meeting in Cannes. I, I decided to choose as a topic of my speech, 
something about the mechanism, which I will not repeat here, but just to, 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 to tell you the title of my speech, suggest immediately the topic. The title of my speech is Systemic Change, the Delicate Mixture of Intentions and Spontaneity. It's the famous the Hayekian topic, and uh, we speak about spontaneous order, we speak about radical economist politicians organizing the, the dramatic uh, change, and the reality is somewhere in between. The reality is the mixture of all that, and to understand the logic of that mixture is, in my opinion, extremely, extremely important. Uh, the, I disagree with, with the ideas that we have to follow some optimal sequencing rules that you have to do one thing and other things. No, that's definitely not true, because you are not opposed with um, passive objects. You are on the other side of the game are millions of citizens of your country who are active players in the game. So you don't dictate. You don't dictate the transformation. You don't dictate the transition. You are a player as well. And exactly the mixture of that is very interesting and intellectually very revealing. So, so the, the task of politicians and of intellectuals is to understand that logic and to, to be able to participate in that. Because the task is clear. The task is to organize or to co-organize the transition and at the same time to minimize non-negligible transformation costs. We economists think in terms of costs. This is, by the way, one of the most fashionable topics uh, to discuss different aspects of, of costs. This is the, the development of economic science in the last decades to develop that that term which is which is traditional in economic science. So the transformation costs to minimize them, which means to make the transition as fast, as smooth as possible. N now, uh, what are the crucial aspects of the game? It seems to me that it has at least three layers, three dimensions. The first floor, the first dimension is an ideological one. The second one is a political one. And the third is an economic one. So speaking about ideology, speaking about ideology, you must be able to formulate a clear and a transparent vision, vision of a society you would like to have. That's absolutely crucial. And again, I would argue that there is a difference between our country and the rest of the post-communist world. Our vision is more transparent and more straightforward than in any other post-communist country. It has some historical re roots uh, because we had our 60s. We had in our country our flirtation with the third way. Some of you may remember the reforms in Czechoslovakia in the 60s to find socialism with a human face. This is something what, what was a crucial topic for all of us. We have been attacking that at that time. I was in the postgraduate age and uh, and uh, that's something for us absolutely crucial so we the country underwent that stage discussed it debated it more or less openly already in the 60s then the russian invasion came we all of us were fired from our um, academic positions, not having the three hours of lectures a week, doing um, jobs much less interesting and much, much less entertaining. But uh, I think it helped us 
it helped us ideologically. So our position is much stronger than in other countries. And we were extremely lucky, at least my generation was extremely lucky because, because of that dramatic crash connected with the Prague Spring and the Soviet invasion, we were absolutely out of any possibility to participate in the old regime. In other countries, with their Pierestroika style reforming in the 70s and 80s, all, almost all our friends, with some exceptions, I see Dr. Winiecki here uh, in Poland, uh, with some, uh, almost with a few exceptions, all our friends in other at that time, communist countries were members of various government commissions, sub-commissions, uh, preparating the perestroika-style reforms. We were not able to do that. Therefore, our position was much more aggressive and much more straightforward, much more ideologically uh, clear. So that's the ideological side of the matter, which, in my opinion, is absolutely absolutely crucial. Second is the political side of the matter, which means the ability of politicians to sell the vision to the citizens of their country. It was a tremendous job and uh, uh, simply we have to persuade the citizens of the country that this is the correct way how to do it. We have to persuade them to enter politics, to to participate in the political process and to create a basic national consensus supporting all of that. Again, it seems to me that my country relatively relatively succeeded in that more than, than some other some other countries. And so that's the political side of the matter which I as an economist um, after five years almost of experience in a political life, um, I consider probably even more important than the technical economic side of the, of the matter. Without basic elementary support, you simply can't do ex anything. So a permanent campaigning, traveling all over the country from Catania to Milano, is uh, and making public speeches. Well, definitely, this week I had three such rallies in my country. Permanent, permanent job, permanent attempt to explain, argue, defend is uh, absolutely crucial. And finally, a few words about the economic side of the matter, the, the reform strategy. Uh, what are the basic, basic uh, moments, basic uh, arguments? Simply, we started, and it seems to me that we have to start, start with a shock. The, the elimination of state paternalism, the elimination of subsidies of all kinds, simply returning the true, true value and true costs to, to all assets and uh, this is a f shock for the population because uh, they lived in a subsidized world where uh, simply nobody knew what the real price of anything is and to do that is a change. Is It changes the psychology, it changes the mentality of the country and it must be done in the preparatory stage, in the first stage already. This is my experience. The second stage really is to liberalize and deregulate markets, standard role to liberalize prices, foreign trade and all of that. Um, the crucial moment or the crucial aspect of the game is to introduce and maintain macroeconomic stability because with huge inflation, you don't have a chance to do anything. So I'm quite happy that in my country, at least I hope, our inflation is already firmly in the one-digit world. 
one digit world below 10 percent this is still higher than in western europe but uh, and it will be as an economist who wrote his doctoral dissertation on inflation it seems to me that the core inflation is still below 10 it, it's not two three four percent in western europe just now so i see as a problem to go down with inflation to that level. That will be a difficult, difficult uh, job with all the adjustment processes still, still going on, which creates some inflationary bias into the, into the system. Uh, as you know, we are a country with a very dramatic macroeconomic policy. And as, as, a, as a finance minister, I, I presented three budgets to the to the parliament. As a prime, as a my finance minister, as a as a prime minister, uh, this Wednesday, we presented my third budget into the parliament. And uh, you must admit that six state budgets, all of them balanced budget with budget without one crown of deficit is something which deserves already a <laughs> debate. And uh, this year, months ago, we, we came with a proposal to incorporate into our constitution a rule simply making it obligatory for the government to present a balanced budget as part of our constitution. I think, again, this is something which some brave European Union members could copy from the Czech Republic. <laughs> And I must express my gratitude to Antonio Martino because we met two, three weeks ago in Chernobyl, Lago di Como, at a conference in Italy, and it was uh, immediately, it, it was days, days after our, our presentation of the idea of the balanced budget as a constitution rule, and our media supposed that I am absolutely crazy to suggest anything like that, and they asked Martino what he thinks about that, and his answer was so positive and unexpected. He was he didn't expect that that question, and uh, I have to express my gratitude, Antonia. It was very helpful, really. <laughs> The role, um, what belongs to the reform strategy, is um, to enact into our constitution and legal system something what in the Hayekian tradition we can call foundational rules as regards basic institutions of the market economy. We have to transform a lot of existing institutions and the final crucial moment is to privatize, privatize state-owned firms and uh, uh, practically in my country the privatization will be, not will not start, the privatization will be over at the end of 1994. There will be nothing to privatize. We will have just some public utilities. The debate will be whether to privatize the railway system or, or something like that. But, uh, but uh, there will be no standard firms still for privatization. So privatization as a, as a systemic change, as a, as a part of, of the syst of the transformation of a political, social and economic system is over. We will have, re we will have residual, residual privatization cases as in Italy, France or any other Western European country today, Sweden, and, and simply individual residual cases which is a standard business inside uh, Western political system, but it, I think the privatization as part, as a crucial cornerstone of the transformation process 
is practically is practically over and then uh, uh, well I think that it was rather interesting and successful to go through that through that process so this is what I, I wanted to to say here this morning and um, well I think that's enough thank you very much <laughs>